My screen's doing something funny today, but I'm just going to ignore it. All right. Uh, first of all, what I said that I wanted to do is I know that uh, I went through that whole Millennium stuff last week uh, pretty quickly, and it's a very complex topic. And so I just wanted to pause a little bit and see if you guys had any questions on any of the stuff we covered last week, or frankly, anything relative to uh, these uh, different dispensational views that, um, that that bugged you after after our conversation. Nobody? All right, let me annoy you with a couple of questions then. Um, because <laughs> one thing that bugged me after the uh, conversation was, okay, does it matter? Does it matter which of these views that we, we, you know, we ascribe to? And the real question is, if you don't believe one of these things, you know, are, are you, are you uh, in trouble in some way? You know, do you really need to believe one of these things or else? So I kind of went through each of the views and said, okay, if I don't believe this view, what are my, what am I, uh, what, what's the potential problem of not believing this view? Okay, so let me just walk through that and then maybe that'll raise other questions uh, for you. And, and if, you know, we don't have to spend any time on this, but I just felt like uh, I was, uh, I was overwhelmed by what I had to say last week. <laughs> All right, so, <laughs> um, so if the if you uh, if you don't believe the pre-trib, pre-millennial view, okay, that has the rapture, it has a thousand-year reign. If you don't believe that, then you may get, be in trouble of um, thinking the whole Bible is somewhat symbolic, right? It's all about symbolism. Uh, it's not real. It uh, you know we can't count on what it says. We always have to interpret things. Um, you know. Uh, maybe I don't have to worry about Christ's return. I don't have to worry about eternal life. I don't have to worry about my sin. I don't have to worry about God's wrath. I could just see you know going down that train of of not uh, of getting confused about if I if I don't believe the pre-trib premillennial, then you know everything then is in question, and uh, you know you, you know you, it it could cause those kinds of concerns in a person. So that. I, I can see that being a problem if you don't believe the pre-trib preview, because it's the most literal uh, view of, uh, you know, of what is what is in the scripture. So any other thoughts on, you know, if you don't believe pre-trib, pre-millennial, what that might, what concerns you might have? What, you know, why do you think that's so important that we believe that? Anybody have any other thoughts before we move on? So Rich, um. Do you include the rapture in that? Yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah, the, the pre-trib premillennial means that you believe in the rapture, the rapture of the church, and that you believe in the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth. Those are the two key things. That's what that's what sets apart the pre-trib premillennial. Yeah, I just didn't know if you would separate the rapture out as a as its own enclave or not in that discussion. So, thanks. Yep. All right. So the next one was the post-trib premillennial. All right. So that that one, they do not believe in the rapture, but they do believe in the thousand year reign of Christ. Right. So in other words, uh, Christians who are alive at that time will not be raptured out. They will go through the tribulation and then Christ will come. So the real difference there is do Christians who are alive go through the tribulation or are they raptured out ahead of time? So in this view, the post-trib premillennial, or also called the historical premillennial, uh, they, they believe that the rapture that the, the rapture does not occur until Christ returns, and that Christians go through the tribulation. So what's the danger if you don't believe that view? If you don't believe that view, you may think that you're exempt from trials in this life somehow, and you may just write off the rapture entirely. I mean. There, there is going to be a rapture in all of these views. The question is when it occurs and who's involved in it, right? Uh, so you don't want to write off the rapture. You don't want to write off, and then you also don't want to write off the possibility of trial in this life and say, well, you know, we're, we're not going to go through the trial. I can do whatever I want. Uh, you know, God's going to, you know, take us all out before we go through that tribulation. I'm not going to have to, I'm not going to have to pay for any of the sins of my life. I'm just saying that's the danger in not believing that uh, 
uh, you know, that, that the Christians will go through this tribulation time. Right, the third view was the amillennial, amillennial view, which means no millennium. But what that actually means is that there's no millennium on earth. There's no thousand year reign on earth. There's no rapture. There's no thousand year reign. There's no rapture before the tribulation. And there's no millennial reign on earth. These are the ones, these are the folks that believe that the millennium is in heaven, that Christ is reigning in heaven, that he's the king in heaven. Uh, and, 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 and that that is their view, that there's no actual millennial reign in heaven, that everything in the thousand year reign uh, is symbolic and is really a, a repetition of the uh, uh, the reign uh, of the of the reign of Christ. It's a repetition. It's the repetition of our Armageddon and talking about the end times, etc. Uh, if you don't believe the amillennial view, it may be that you don't take seriously that today you are part of the heavenly kingdom. That you're a child of the king, right? That that heaven is your home. If you don't if you don't take the amillennial view seriously, you could get you could fall into that of just not taking. You know, we're not going to be kings until the end. Uh, no, uh, you know, scripture over and over again talks about us being kings now. So that that's a that's just a danger if you don't take that view. And then finally, the post-millennial view, these are the folks who believe in kind of a, a, uh, a gradual millennium, that we that the millennium is, is actually now here on earth, uh, that, that Satan has been bound when Christ uh, died on the cross, and we are in the millennium now, and we're going to get better and better and better until, uh, you know, until Christ reigns on the earth. Um, so, so if you don't believe that view then the danger is that you don't take your sanctification uh, seriously. You don't take your growth in Christ seriously. You, you, you get the view that God will fix everything in heaven. Um, you know, I'm, I'm dependent upon his forgiveness. I don't need to worry about growing in Christ. I don't need to worry about um, uh, you know, my own sanctification here on earth. So I think those are the, those are the dangers if you don't believe those particular views. And I, I think, so, as I as I kind of said last week, uh, I, I kind of uh, you know what is my position? I'm kind of uh, uh, I have uh, pieces of every one of these positions that I believe, <laughs> and uh, so and I think the the dilemma that you have in in choosing one view too strongly is then you interpret the rest of Scripture based on that view rather than interpreting Scripture based upon what it says, and so I, I would just be careful about locking yourself into one of these boxes and say, well, I'm definitely this. Because then you have a tendency to interpret a lot of other things um, based on that particular view rather than just letting scripture speak to you. And so I just wanted to, that's kind of where I am. I just wanted to say that again and just um, open this up again for any kind of other conversations that you guys might have. That screen is weird today. Is your screens weird today, or is it just me? I some I think, I'm wondering if somebody's got their uh, screen shares or screen sa or sharing on or something. Because yeah, it's, Rich, it's, did you share your screen accidentally? See that no. little box by the microphone to the right of the microphone? Did no. you accidentally click on share? It's like we're seeing a screen of your screen. Yep, that's. I was thinking, wondered who who actually had, had yeah, accidentally sh better. shared the screen. Because I was seeing the same, I was wondering the same thing. Did it just go back? Yep. Yep. Did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I may have done that. I don't know what I done, but what did what Patty said? Maybe I clicked on something. All right, good. When you were clicking on getting ready to click rec the record, maybe you hit that by mistake. Could be. All right, good. All right, so that's the millennium. Any other questions or comments on the millennium? We're gonna, you know, I'm gonna say that we're gonna revisit this again as we go through the rest of Revelation because uh, we're gonna have to uh, understand what view we're talking about as we look at the rest of Revelation. But any other comments about it or questions before we go on? So not to get too deep into this, but so Russell and I were talking about this earlier in the week, and so I was trying to, you know, we were just talking about our our beliefs and how it applies to us, and so I, I'm. And I don't want it to sound like I'm just I don't care, but I, I, I was trying to figure out I, I, 
I don't give a whole lot of thought to a lot of this personally, because it to me it is we've talked about it, it is what it is, <coughs> and, um, and I'm trying to even think how how you get to the some of these positions, and so I've been a believer since I was a kid, and uh, so and I've also been a Southern Baptist since I was a kid, so all the teaching I've received is kind of that. You know, the I'm not even gonna try to figure out which one it was the post pre or whatever it is. <laughs> and um, and so that's what I've always heard. I've heard lots of it, and descriptions and lots of evidence as to why. And so I just never have gotten into the other. And then I would so just this week, it, it kind of dawned on me maybe that for people who become believers later in life or, you know, haven't grown up in some of this and ha have to go figure out some of this, that's to me is probably where a lot of this pertains more, you know, for a lot of people. Um, I don't know what anybody else thinks, but um, that's, that's, that's kind of where I thought kind of came to me this week a little bit about that. And cause it does apply to, you know, people who've never really been in the Bible and who are new believers and have to figure out and kind of hear hear different things and figure out where they are and where God, you know, God is in all this. So it was just interesting to have that thought process this week um, after some discussions and, and just going through some of this. Yeah, I think, that, uh, I think your point is well taken, CT, that a lot of us have, have grown up in a church of some kind where we have heard a message, uh, you know, uh, that uh, that is associated with one of these views. Um, and so you, you kind of assume that that's the right view and I, or, or that's the only view <laughs> or that's the view, right? Um, I, I guess what I'm just trying to show you is that there are there are many views on this. And, 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 and I think, unfortunately, uh, if you get locked into one of these views, you miss some richness in what God is trying to say in some of the passages. And so that's why uh, I'm, I am opening up your brains a little bit on this. I, and I understand that. As somebody, as, as somebody has said that, you know, that, that they're a pan millennius, uh, which means it, it'll all pan out in the end, right? So um, <laughs> that may I, I be remember hearing that where I am, unfortunately. Remember, the, I think the first time I heard that was uh, Danny Forshee. <laughs> yeah. So I, I just wanted to throw in my, my view on this. I, I probably studied the book of Revelation and the book of Genesis more than any other any other books in the Bible. And I, I like CT, I was raised a, a believer or was, became a believer as, as a child, raised in a uh, Christian family, um, exposed to Actually, I was exposed to all of the, these views of, of Revelation. And going to, um, I spent most of my school years in Christian schools, so I was taught um, various various viewpoints. And I, I guess I, I just, I, I mostly like you. I come down on the the pre-trib rapture and um, that what's probably the most conventional view um, for the same reason that, that you stated that it's it's the simplest it's the easiest to it, it fits the best it's the most literal it's the easiest to to put together but I I also know that I've, I've studied men much wiser than I who vehemently disagree with each other on on these views and um I, I i think it's it's something that we we just aren't capable of knowing in our in our human minds because there there are things when god reveals himself to us there there are things that we just can't comprehend and when he when he explains when he gave john this vision to explain to us, he explained it, or he showed John, but even John couldn't comprehend what he was seeing. He, he, he struggled to find the words to explain what he was seeing. So even, and, and I realized God gave him the words, but he was, he was giving it in 
from from the human perspective, I guess it, it, that's that's all we're able to comprehend of God. So I think there's something in these these views of the millennium that is is too big for us to grasp. Is is um, not not within our our human mind to be able to understand. So I, I appreciate you pointing out the pitfalls of not believing um, different views and and I, you know I, I guess you can't you can't believe all of every one of them without disagreeing with others. So um, I just I come down on on the side of I understand as much as I can understand and um, the part that I don't understand probably I don't need to at this point. I think that's, I think a, good that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, shall we go? Ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so yeah, I, I, I agree with CT. I think one of the main things I take away from this is all these, other than what John was showed, uh, everything else is what man's interpretation of this is. Um, the thing I kind of take grasp of is that in all these views, there's, there's nothing that questions my salvation. So it's not like you got to believe one or the other in order to be saved. Um, so I kind of look at it. I mean, I when you said, you know, it all pan out, I kind of look at that. You know, I'm going to be here till he calls me home. And if I'm here during the tribulation or if I'm here to be raptured, that's his plan. So I have to take take faith in that, that he's got it all under control. And like Rick says, I'm not I'm not smart enough to understand it. And so, you know, almost look at it. You know, is it a, I don't want to say a waste of my time, but is it a waste of my time to try to figure out when I'm going? So, you know, I'm going I'm going at some time. Just don't know when. That's in his plan. And uh, like I say, I can just rest in the the knowing that I'm saved, I'm his child, and he's gonna take me home when he's ready. So but it is very interesting. I mean, Revelation has always been a book to because uh, I've had people that I've listened to that uh, you know, my dad was it, it it is it is divine, it's inspired, and if he says the locusts are coming and they're gonna be shooting fire out their mouth, that's what they're gonna do. But I've heard other people say, well. For technology, you know, Black Hawk helicopter looks just like a locust, and when they fire those missiles, it looks like he's shooting fire, and that could be what it is. You know, it's a so it, it's a matter of interpretation. Okay, I don't want to belabor this. I just wanted to just open it up, and and uh, I, I I actually I absolutely agree with what you guys are saying. You know, this is not a salvation issue. Uh, it's amazing that. I, I guess what what I really wanted to get across is that when we talk about people with other views in this area, don't just um, say, "Well, that's a stupid view." <laughs> that, that view doesn't make any sense. Actually, these people have very cogent, sensible, uh, worked out uh, ideas on how these fit scripture and how it fits our salvation, et cetera. And, uh, and and we need to respect that. And, and not just think, well, this is the only view I've ever heard, and this is obviously the right view. Uh, there are other views that actually make sense. So, all right, uh, let's wrap that up. I want to go back and deal with uh, Rick's question from last week. Um, the, 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 the question that, that comes up here about where do we go when we die? Um, uh, this, is a, this is an important question that I think that we get a little confused about. And I got to tell you, I, I stepped into this question thinking, well, this is kind of obvious, and then uh, you know got bounced around and uh, ended up, I think, in a good place. Um, so what I want to do is actually just read you this, is go through the scriptures with you uh, that actually talk about this, and then uh, and then in the end uh, have a conversation with you about it. So we'll start with uh, Matthew 27, verse 52. Matthew 27, 52. So here you have the, the when Jesus actually dies on the cross in uh, in Jesus in uh, in uh, 
Matthew 27, 52, and it says, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. So here, when Jesus died on the cross, that, the, that there was something that happened where the graves were opened, the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. So let's just leave that a second. Go to John chapter 11, verse 11. This is the story of Lazarus, uh, the Lazarus, the, fin the friend of Christ. There's a couple of two different Lazarus we'll be talking about here in Scripture. But this is Lazarus, the friend of Christ in, uh, in John chapter 11, verse 11. Mine says, and the, uh, these things he said, and after that, he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps. I go that I may wake him up. And then his disciples says, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. So uh, let me keep going. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking a rest and sleep. And then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, et cetera, et cetera. So here we have Jesus talking about Lazarus, and he says that he sleeps. And the, and the disciples got confused, thinking, well, if he's asleep, he's just going to wake up. What's the problem? He's saying, no, he's not, he's not just asleep, he's dead. The problem is that word that he used there for sleep can be interpreted both as being dead and being simply asleep. When the disciples, uh, you remember uh, at Gethsemane, when the disciples fell asleep, that same word for sleep is the same word that's used here for Lazarus is asleep. So that word can be interpreted two different ways. And here the disciples interpreted it the wrong way. Jesus was actually saying that Lazarus was dead, but he used the word asleep. Um, in Acts chapter 7, <clears throat> Acts chapter 7, verse 60, the last verse in Acts chapter 7. I can't find Acts. I know it's in my Bible somewhere. It's Acts chapter 7, verse 60. Here we have... Um, here we have the, the uh, stoning of Stephen. I cannot find the verse. There we go. <clears throat> it says, then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice. This is Stephen. Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Again, that same word as sleep is used. Obviously, he's dead at this point. Uh, First Corinthians chapter 15. Let me let me just pause. Let me just stop there. Uh, let me give you these verses. We don't need to go look them up. First uh, Corinthians 15. Verses 20 and following talks about Christ being the first fruits of those of us who fall asleep. And then 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 through 16 <coughs> is actually the verses about the rapture, which talks about those who are asleep in Christ. So this word asleep is used uh, talking about death over and over in Scripture. So that's the first word that I want you to get in your head. <clears throat> is this word asleep? He says that we're asleep. Now go to Luke chapter 16. <clears throat> Luke chapter 16, before I tell you which verse. So if you just take those verses alone, there are there is a belief by some that um, <coughs> that when you die, you simply go to sleep. You simply go unconscious. You simply, somebody just pushes the pause button on your life. And that, every, every by the way, all of these uh, folks all believe in a bodily resurrection at the end, right? But in, so what some folks believe that you, you're, you're just in kind of this uh, sleep state uh, that just kind of uh, the pause button has been pushed until the bodily resurrection and then you're back to being conscious again, that, that, that all this time that you're dead, that you're unconscious uh, until, uh, until the bodily resurrection. Now let's look at some other scripture. Luke chapter 16, verse 19. <clears throat> 16, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> 16, 19, here we have. <clears throat> Excuse me, here we have the rich man Lazarus story, right? 
Let me just read through it. <clears throat> there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So that it was the be so that so that so it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And then he cried to the he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us, you and I, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor those from there pass to us. And then he says, you know, go and, and warn the others, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But here you have a different picture, right? Uh, it, not just sleep, these folks are uh, conscious uh, in this state. Um, you, have, uh, you have Lazarus who is in this place called Abraham's bosom, and you have the rich man who is in Hades. Uh, the rich man in Hades is being tormented. Uh, the the uh, Lazarus in Abraham's bosom is being comforted, right? So that picture is important. Now, um, go also now to uh, Luke chapter 23. <clears throat> chapter 23, verse 43. And here's the story of the, um, the, thieves, the thieves on the cross, right? Which also plays into this. Luke 23, 43. <clears throat> and Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So the question then is, okay, so this thief who, you know, who recognized Jesus as the Savior on the cross, Jesus says, you're going to be with me in paradise. So paradise is only used <clears throat> in Scripture two times. Let me show you the other time, and then we'll have the conversation. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 12, verse 2. Second Corinthians 12, 2. Mine says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. So here, here we have the other place where paradise is talked about. So, <clears throat> so let, me, let me just lay that on the table. Uh, what are your thoughts about what you've just heard relative to what happens to us when we die? in paradise that's where that phrase comes from right that that you that uh you know that you will be with christ when you die he says you will be with me today in paradise so here's where i am here's where i come down on this i think that um when we talk about uh when you die you sleep i think the point there is that you're going to be reawakened i don't think it has anything to do with you being unconscious because i think that we talk about the the picture of abraham's bosom Right, that they're they're obviously they were conscious and able to see one another. In fact, across the Gulf uh, during this time. But I think the main thing is that uh, you will be with Christ and you will be comforted during this time. Now, are you in heaven? That's another question, right? I think the answer is that you're in paradise. You're in some kind of uh, in-between state, waiting on. Uh, waiting on your body, right? Waiting on the, the, the resurrection of your body. You're with Christ. Uh, you're being comforted with Christ. Now, are you in heaven? Is this, is this third heaven paradise that's talked about heaven? It could very well be. You could be in heaven as a spirit, right? You're not going to get your body till later. You could be in heaven as a spirit, conscious, knowing what's going on, 
and then you get your body later. That is absolutely a uh, acceptable understanding of the scriptures that are here. Any any thoughts or comments on that? I, I... So are, are these is paradise referring to the the place where the saints are under the altar? Could be right. Uh, yeah, so it could be. And and Rick, to your point, you know what? How do you how do you link together the rapture? And the uh, you know and this being present with the Lord, I think the point is you are present with the Lord in spirit, but in the rapture you're connected back to your body, <laughs> right? The rapture is the rapture of the bodies. Uh, you you get your body back and you have the glorified not your body back. You get your glorified body, right? Your spirit and your and and this glorified body get connected, get reconnected in the rapture. That's that understanding. So I don't think there's any there's no problem with those two scriptures. Those two ideas. Any other thoughts or questions? Does this make sense? Sort of. Okay, we're going to be we're going to be actually talking about the other side. What happens to sinners when they die? Uh, as we get into uh, Revelations 11 and following, uh, but but I thought we needed to cover that piece because it was still kind of left open. Uh, it, what's interesting is the same question came up in the other class, so uh, it was good for me to take some time to look at it. All right, anything else on that? <clears throat> we'll be good to get back into Revelation chapter 20. Oh, we're very quiet today. All right, Revelation chapter 20. Uh, verse 11. So here we get into the uh, great white, white throne judgment. Uh, we will not finish this today. Uh, there's a lot in here. Um, and I want to make sure we take our time and go through it. And then also we have to deal a little bit with some of these uh, um, dispensational understandings uh, with regard to this also. So we will. The first thing I want to say is everybody, every commentator, uh, everyone who has a dispensational view believes that there will be a white throne judgment, <laughs> right? That there will be a judgment that comes uh, where man will have to stand before the judge and he will be judged. Satan's job throughout eternity has been to deceive men about this event. That to deceive men that this is not going to happen. Don't worry about the judgment of God. This is uh, God is not real. Uh, God is only good. He certainly is not wrathful. He's uh, God is not the creator. God is not a moral judge. You're just going to go into oblivion when you die. All of that thinking is Satan trying to convince people that this event is not going to happen. Well, this event is going to happen, <laughs> and uh, we're going to get the details of it as we get here into uh, into uh, <coughs> verse 11 and following. <clears throat> so let me just read through 11 through 15 first, and then we'll come back and, and pick up at verse 11. <clears throat> so verse 11 it says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one, according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, this is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. All right. <clears throat> so let's go back to verse 11. I saw a great white throne. Now, you know, we've said this many times that when, when John says, I saw, that means he's having a new vision, right? Here's a new vision about this, uh, this white throne judgment. And he's seeing a throne. Now, 
uh, we've seen thrones before in uh, in Revelation. If you go all the way back to chapter four, and we looked at the throne of God, the throne room, God sitting on the throne. Um, this may be that throne. It may be a different throne, and I'll explain why in a minute. But the main thing that we know about this throne is this is the throne of judgment. Uh, let me just go back and show you a couple of scriptures. Go back to Psalm chapter 9. All through scripture, it talks about that there's going to be a throne of judgment. This should not be a surprise for anyone, even though, as I said, uh, Satan is trying to deceive us that this is not going to happen. In many, many, many places, it talks about this throne of judgment. In Psalm chapter 9, verse 7, it says, But the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment. Right? There is a throne that's prepared for judgment. Go back to our good friend Daniel, chapter 7. And we have heard about this throne before. Daniel, chapter 7. Verse, uh, lots of verses, but we'll start at verse 9. <clears throat> verse 9, where we've heard about the, 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 fine, the end times here before, and look at the way it talks about it in verses 9 and 10. Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 and 10, it says, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days, and we said that is God, was seated. His garments were white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool, his throne was a fiery flame, and its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousand ministered to him, ten thousand times ten thousand before him. The court was seated, and the books were open. So this is a reference to exactly the same place where we are right now. God is sitting on this judgment throne, and he's opening up the books. Um, one other place I just want to show you in Romans chapter 2. Verse 5, <clears throat> Romans 2, 5 says, But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. There's going to be a judgment of God. He's going to sit on the throne and... Uh, there's no question about that. So before I go back to uh, what throne this is, <clears throat> let's first of all I'll deal with the question of who is on the throne? Who's sitting on this throne? Anybody? <clears throat> Who's sitting on the throne? Sounds like an easy question. It says, it says the Lord is sitting on the throne. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So let's, let's go back. Let's go back just to Revelations. Let's look at chapter 4, verse 2. Chapter 4, verse 2 in Revelations, right? Immediately I was in the spirit. Behold, a throne was seven set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And when we were there in chapter 4, we said that one was God. In chapter 5, verse 1, and I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. So that, that hymn was obviously uh, God because he hands the scroll to the Lamb. Uh, chapter 13, excuse me, chapter 5, verse 13. And every creature which is in heaven and, in, and on the earth and under the earth and as such of the sea and all the nations, I heard them saying, Behold, honor and glory and power to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. So we're talking about God here, chapter 6, verse 16. And said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. <clears throat> chapter 7, verse 10. And crying out with a loud voice, saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Chapter 15 in chapter 7, chapter 7, verse 15, chapter 7. Verse 15, therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. Chapter 19, which we just looked at, verse 4. Chapter 19, verse 4. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. So here we have God sitting on the throne. He is the one that sits on the throne. 
except <laughs> go back to chapter three of Revelation, <clears throat> chapter three, verse 21. Chapter three, verse 21. It says, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So here we have Christ sitting on God's throne. Uh, go to Revelation chapter 22, <clears throat> verse 1. It said, And he showed me a pure river of water, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So here again we have the throne talked about as the throne of God and of the Lamb. And then finally, not finally, but go to Acts. Acts chapter 17. <clears throat> Acts chapter 17, verse 30. <clears throat> 17, 30. He says, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So look at what that says. It says he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He's given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So he's saying that God is going to judge the world, but he's going to judge the world through Christ, right? He's the one who he raised through the dead. Now go back to John, uh, Gospel of John, chapter 5, and we'll kind of pull these together. John, chapter 5, uh, verse 22. Let's start at 21, 521. It says, for as the father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the son gives life to whom he will. For the father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the son, so that, that all should honor the son just as they honor the father. He who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life, and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death unto life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. And as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So this is a very complex verse with a lot of information in it. I first, you may want to keep your finger there because we may go back to it. But the main thing I want to pull out here is, so who is, who is sitting on the throne? <clears throat> I think what you have sitting on the throne is God in the form of the Lamb, <laughs> right? God in the form of Christ. To me, these scriptures just point out that God and Christ are one, right? This is God doing the judgment through Christ in the, in the, in the picture of the Lamb, in the form of the Lamb, in, as revealed in Christ. Uh, it, it just brings all of that together, that Christ uh, is the judge, that God is the judge. Uh, that is the one, that he is the one who is sitting on the throne. All right, everybody okay with that? You good? <clears throat> now, the next thing it says, I saw the white throne and he who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. The heaven and the earth fled away from, mine says the face, yours may, yours may say the presence of God. The earth and the, and the 
What does your translation say in that in those two sentences? Anybody? Presence. The presence. And does it say the heaven fled away? Earth and sky fled away from his presence. Okay. Anybody else have any other words? Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> so what does it mean that the that the the heaven and the earth fled away from his presence? I think one very good clarification statement on this is it actually in chapter 21, verse 1. <clears throat> <clears throat> Mine says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and also there was no more sea. So what I believe is being said here is that is that when when Christ arrives on the throne, his presence in his presence can be no sin, can be no evil. And so the very earth which has been tainted by sin and the very heavens that have been tainted by sin disappear. Uh, are uh, are consumed, uh, 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 go away, <laughs> uh, go out of existence. They're no longer there. Uh, they completely flee away from God. And this is this is we, we see this in a lot of scriptures. But what 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 I believe is happening here is what you might call uncreation, right? God is the God of creation. Here He uncreates. Uh, what was created by Him is no longer there. Uh, it passes away. Look at Second Peter chapter three. Second Peter three verse ten. <clears throat> Mine says, "But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements melt with fervent heat. Both earth and the works that are in it will be burned up." I think this is exactly what he's talking about. This day of the Lord, you know, when we talked about the day of the Lord, it kind of is a, is, a, is a long period of time that actually ends right here with this judgment. This is the final bit of the day of the Lord, if you will, the final piece, uh, which is this white throne judgment. And when this occurs, the heaven and the earth pass away. And I love that with a great noise or with a great roar, uh, everything just uh, is crushed away. I don't know how else to say it. Um, look at verse 11 then. I'm still in uh, uh, 2 Peter 3.10. Therefore, since all these things will be dis dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and goodness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. I mean, this picture of everything just being... Um, destroyed, just being uh, taken out of his existence is there. So at this point in, in time, God uncreates everything. Everything is dissolved. Everything goes away. Now, what's interesting there is where then is the throne? <laughs> where then is the throne if the heavens and the earth are dissolved and passed away? My answer to that question uh, is that the throne exists outside of space and time. Uh, it, it's, it, that throne exists outside. There is no more space. There is no more time. God has dissolved the universe. God has dissolved all things, all of creation, all the things that he has put in place is dissolved. All that is now there is the throne of God. Oh, and by the way, verse 12, and I saw the dead, small and great. So here you have the throne and God somehow outside of space and time, and you have all of the dead there. Now, next time, I'm going to stop here. <clears throat> Next time, we want to deal with who are the dead. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, where did they come from? And where are they going? <laughs> right? And then how is God judging? On what basis is he judging? And how does that judgment take place? All of that is wrapped up in the scripture. So it's very important that we take our time and walk through that. But this, I just want you to get this picture of this, this throne of God, this throne of judgment. God in the form of Jesus is on that throne, ready to judge as he has said he will. And the dead are all around him in this non-space, non-time, spiritual state. All right, so we'll leave it at that for now. And uh, we'll pick it up next time. Did, uh, this is called a cliffhanger. Joey and I have been having a conversation about what's a cliffhanger. Anyway, so this is your cliffhanger, so that you make sure you make it back next week. So again, next week we will meet, we'll finish up the White Throne Judgment, and we'll have two weeks off from me teaching, but you guys are welcome and uh, encouraged uh, to go back to, uh, to church on the 13th, and then on the 27th we'll figure out what in the world we're doing with class uh, during that time. All right, any questions on any of this? First of all, anything on, on the White Throne Judgment at this point that you want to ask? Or are there questions that you want me to make sure that I answer next time when we get back together? So Rich, I just had a question. When it talks about the earth and the heaven um, fled from his presence, is that could that be the heavens as in the atmospheric skies, or is that <clears throat> heaven? Um, as we think of it, because a lot of times in the Bible, the heavens are, are the sky. Yeah, yeah, it could be. It could be, Dan. I guess the only reason I think it is not is because of chapter 21, because he brings in a new heaven and a new earth. Well, that means that the old heaven is not there. So that's the only reason I believe that when he dissolves it, he dissolves the whole business, including the old heaven. But but there are many who believe exactly what you say, Dan, that, that uh, he's just talking about the sky and the birds and all that stuff. So I'm just telling you where I am. Any other questions before we? All right. Have a good week. Uh, Hugh, Hugh? He's, he's, he's the only what, Hugh, how can, how can you pray for us, Hugh, if you're not there? I guess Trace, Tracy's going to have to pray for us. <laughs> Let me let me just let me just pray for us as we go, okay? <clears throat> Dear Lord, we just uh, we just thank you for this opportunity to look into your Word, Father, to understand it, to be uh, to become more clear. It is called your revelation, Father. It is called the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's, it's so that we can understand more about you, Lord. There's some things that we don't understand, and as, as Rick has said, there are things we just our brains can't capture, Father. And, and so, Lord, we understand that, but we thank you for what you you have told us, Father. We thank you for the, the clarity of the things that, that give us hope about the future, that also give us trepidation about the future, Father, and, and give us a encouragement to go out and, and tell others about you because of what this future is and, and what's going to happen to to the unredeemed, Father. Lord, we just ask for, for more clarity as we get into this, and, and particularly as we talk about this this white throne judgment, Father, help us to understand this because this is this is going to happen, Father, and we need to understand so that we can uh, talk to others about it. Lord, we particularly lift up uh, uh, Debbie and, and uh, her family uh, during this time, Father. We just know that this is uh, this was quick and sudden and and, and uh, impactful, Father, and uh, we just thank you for the the blessing uh, that her mom has been. We 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 thank you for the. The sacrifice that Debbie and, and Russell have made uh, through many years to to help her mom and dad, Father, and uh, and we know that that she appreciates that, Father. Lord, we just uh, we just ask you to be with them and comfort them during this time and give them what they need, Father. Lord, for others who have uh, who are need uh, your medical health right now, Father, who uh, have cancer that need to be dealt with, Father, we just ask you to work there. We know that you can do miraculous things, Father. We know that you can do powerful things. And Lord, we just ask you to, to watch over those folks. Lord, all of us, as we kind of uh, step out of our shells uh, with regard to what's going on with this uh, pandemic, Father, Lord, we just ask you to protect us. We ask you to help us to be smart, but uh, we know that only you can actually protect us. So Lord, we just ask you to watch over us, uh, give us uh, knowledge as to what we should do, Father. 
Uh, but, but, but Lord, we just ask us, uh, you know, we can't live in fear because we know that you are God and you're in charge. And so, Father, we just depend upon you and we just lean on you in all things. But we just thank you now and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, folks, have a good week. We love you. And uh, we'll see you next week. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye, Tim.